Listen in as I chat with Chris Taylor of Actionable Books, which up until recently was run from a cave in Spain. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day listeners and welcome back to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some great marketing. And to that end, let's get stuck right in. Small business, big marketing with Tim Reid. Now, what I should have said was it's not only Australia's number one marketing show, it's New Zealand's number one marketing show every now and then on the iTunes store as well. And that's particularly appropriate because I am sitting in a car in Queenstown, New Zealand, right now. Yep. How's that? That is one strange place to podcast. Probably not that strange, but yeah, sitting, I'm sitting, uh, it's on the Esplanade, whatever that main road is. I'm looking out onto the beautiful Queenstown Lake. There are mountains capped with snow, the Remarkables, Coronet Peak. There are people going past on, past on, uh, what are they called? Jet boats and there's people parachuting from the sky. This place is amazing. Why am I sitting in a car in Queenstown? Because my hotel room is noisy. Yep. The kids next door are screaming, not mine, someone's kids. And I figured, maybe a car will be quieter. So I'm quite liking the acoustic. Uh, Now, you might have, if you listened to last week's show, um, I am traveling a lot anyway. Punching out a weekly episode, which is what I do, sometimes comes with its challenges due to my timing and travel schedule. So I'm actually talking at a conference in Queenstown and uh, what an amazing, amazing place. Boy, oh boy, there are so many marketing lessons here. Uh, everything is about experience in Queenstown. And if you're building experience into your business, then you are probably doing okay. Uh, interviewed a few uh, business owners that offer experiences. Brad Smith from BRAP, Miss Chu from Miss Chu Vietnamese Tuck Shops. They offer experiences. Have a listen to those and you'll you'll hear what I mean. Uh, very, very big show today. Got Chris Taylor from Actional Book, Actionable Books, who has been running his business out of a cave in Spain up until very recently. I want to share something that happened earlier this week at a keynote I gave in Melbourne, uh, which was kind of interesting. Lessons to be learned from that. Uh, and we'll get stuck into our interview very shortly. But first, let me tell you about the very good folk at Net Registry. You see, Net Registry are there to help you nail all your online marketing needs and some you didn't even know you had. So like if whether it's registering a domain name, website design and hosting, helping you get found on Google, they can even set you up with an email marketing campaign. You've got to love that because I know how many small business owners do struggle with the old email marketing. Now, ensuring you have a decent digital footprint is critical in marketing your business and that goes way beyond Having a website team, you know that by now if you're a long-time listener to this show, having a website is just the start. So head over to Net Registry today and see how they can get your online marketing sorted. It'll be much cheaper and easier than you think. Netregistry.com.au is where you'll find them and tell them Timbo sent you. Righto, so earlier this week, I was the opening keynote speaker at the Real Estate Institute of Victoria's conference at Crown Casino in uh, in Melbourne. There was a few hundred real estate agents eagerly awaiting some marketing goodness from me. So as usual, I rolled up to the venue early. Beautiful venue, really, really impressive venue. And uh, the Real Estate Institute had put on such a big effort to put it, to make a great conference and expo. So I roll up a couple of hours early as I do, always like to get the AV sorted, the audio visual stuff sorted, make sure my slide deck looks beautiful up on the screens, make sure the embedded videos are working, that we can hear them, we can see them, that my clicker's working, I do a sound check, do all the stuff that you want to so that all those kind of worry points, those pain points are removed and you can just completely focus on sharing quality content. Everything didn't go to plan, unfortunately. Now, uh, it wasn't my fault, but it was my problem that the AV guys just couldn't get the technical stuff working. And with literally two minutes to go, 
my slide deck is not appearing on the big screens around the venue, which means I don't really have a keynote because my slide deck has lots and lots of marketing case studies, helpful marketing case studies embedded in it. And I really need them. I need to be able to show them. I can still talk about the concept of helpful marketing and do all that type of stuff. But visually, I need to show people some examples so they can see how it applies to their business. So two minutes in before I'm about to go on, the MC is starting to introduce me and they are still trying to get the slideshow working. Uh, at that point, I tapped the, the client, lovely lady, tapped her on the shoulder and said, listen, Let's go to plan B, and plan B is that we are going to do a Q&A uh, question and answer session. So we've got three roving mics situated throughout. It was a la- really large room situated throughout the room, and as I'm being introduced, those mics are getting in, into position. I walk up on stage and drop the bad news that there is no keynote talk, but I am going to do a Q&A. And look, the bottom line is it went really, really well. Thankfully, sometimes with Q&As, people are scared to put up their hand. Thankfully, people did put up their hand, and they were wonderful questions. So I kind of worked out a couple of learnings. One is be prepared for worst-case scenario. Don't panic. Take a step back. I took a step back. Everyone was going crazy around me beforehand trying to get this problem sorted. I just stepped back. I took some deep breaths, uh, knew I knew my stuff, acknowledged to myself that I knew my stuff, and did suggested and did the Q&A. And that was really a a wonderful kind of reward for me to say, um, yeah, okay, I can do that. There's another little string to my bow. Secondly, and more importantly, it was wonderful for the audience because they're, they're having questions answered that are absolutely on their mind. Now, my keynote, I would hope, answers questions that are on the mind of motivated small business owners as well. But this was absolutely tailor made, and what I what I noticed too is that as people were asking questions, I was integrating elements of my keynote into the discussion anyway. So, um, yeah, really good learning, I guess, for all of us. Um, acknowledge more often that we know our stuff. Um, back yourself when the chips are looking you down, and is that is that a phrase? When the chips are down, and just go for it, and. If and when you do succeed, and chances are you will, give yourself a pat on the back and acknowledge a little achievement. We don't do it enough. In fact, inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum, we have a little section called the Winner's Circle, where I love members sharing their big and their small wins because it makes us feel good. You get acknowledged by your peers. And, you know, as small business owners, Often we're often we're operating in a bit of a vacuum. So um, yeah, there's a little learning, something that happened earlier this week, and it all went tickety boo. Okay, listeners, um, because I'm sitting in a car in Queenstown (laughs) watching the snowfall, which it is, I am going to get stuck straight into today's guest and get on with the rest of the show. Now I got an email recently from a Kira Hug. What a lovely name, Kira Hug. And uh, she said, Dear John Keating, I mean Tim Reed, I am a Dead Dead Poet Society fan too. Yeah, you would have heard me speak previously about loving uh, that character, John Keating, in Dead Poet Society. Kira says, I'm a new listener and fellow marketing junkie. Well, welcome, Kira. Your conversation with Ryan Clark is one of my favorites. Hilarious opening question. Oh, that was a few episodes back. Anyway, if you're looking for a radical entrepreneur for your show, I recommend Chris Taylor founder of Actional Books. I'm biased because I also work with him. Here's some reasons why you should consider Chris. This is good. This is a really good uh, approach. Get a lot of approaches from people wanting to be interviewed on the show. And Kira gave me some really solid reasons why. Number one was he has failed a lot. He founded Actionable Books after failing in another business, going back to the drawing board and committing, wait for this, to reading 52 business development books in 52 weeks and applying one concept from each into his life. And that's how actionable books started. Isn't that a great idea? Number two, the business runs on a results-only work environment as as comprised of six staff, 24 independent contractors, and 76 volunteers spanning six countries and nine time zones. Hey, that's breaking some rules. She also says actionable books now boasts over 500 free and actionable book summaries including a community of entrepreneurs who want to change their lives. Number four, 
Chris runs his business from a cave in Spain. <laughs> Love that. That caught my attention. You'll find out very shortly he's just moved out of a cave, the cave onto an olive farm above ground. Uh, and uh, I just thought it sounded like a really, really interesting interview. Uh, Kira suggested he would be a good fit for the show. You are spot on, Kira. And then she says, P.S. Chris has interviewed Seth Godin and Gary Vaynerchuk. And don't worry, team. I ask how on earth. He got in front of them. Enough from me. Here is Chris Taylor from Actionable Books. Now, I understand you live in a cave in Spain. True or false? (laughs) Uh, True up until three months ago, and uh, we've since come out into the sunlight into a uh, a big farmhouse in Spain. (laughs) A big farmhouse in Spain. For nine months. Well, just imagining right. that you were still four months ago in the cave in Spain, what was that about? It was, uh, you know, it was really interesting, Tim. My wife, there's a long backstory, but the, uh, as my dad would say, it's a three beer story that, uh, we'll, we'll simplify down to a couple sentences. Um, my wife and I were over here in 2012 in Spain and, uh, just fell in love with this particular region. And so started looking at what we could do to get back here for a period of time. And we found this big, beautiful house, big five bedroom house. It was very reasonably priced down right by the sea. And we were all set, ready to move in up an above ground house. And uh, and then about a month and a half before we made the move, the owners uh, decided to sell the property and, uh, you know, told us at the 11th hour. And so we scrambled. My wife started doing uh, she's an exceptionally uh, talented Google researcher, I've learned. Mm -hmm. And uh, she found this house that's it's a it was um, a self-sufficient house so off the grid and it was in order to stay cool in the summer and warm in the winter was actually built into the side of a mountain and so it was this amazing place where it felt light and airy and I mean it had 16 foot ceilings but it was truly a cave and built into the side of, uh, of a mountain so that's where we were out of interest what was the internet connection like in a cave you know, surprisingly better than it is uh, in the farmhouse that we're in now. So it was, <laughs> what irony. they had it all figured out. It was great. Yeah. So Fred and Barney would have been quite okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love it, mate. Oh, that's fantastic. What, why did you move to Spain in the first place? Um, you know, when I started Actionable Books, Tim, there was really two criteria for me. One was that um, we would have a derivative-based business, meaning we could uh, produce and sell the same thing over and over again. Um, and the second was that it would allow me to be geographically free. Um, and, you know, five years years into the business, I'd never really tested that for any length of time, the, the second part. Um, and uh, and yeah, we both, we just loved Spain, Amy and I, my wife. And so we said, if we're going to do it, let's do it to a place that we're just that excited to be in. And uh, and we, you know, a couple of false starts, but um, but made the move here in September of 2013 and, uh, and haven't looked back since. Interesting. Just explain, I haven't heard the term, I've heard the concept of selling the same thing over and over again, but derivative-based business- it's my language. Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, if it's a common widespread term, but uh, that's how I describe it. So uh, that is the selling the same thing. So generally, derivative based businesses are online, or is that is it like actionable books? Is a derivative based business? I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's mostly digital products in mm. the sense that you know one person buying it doesn't deplete your stock. stock. Yeah, um, yeah, is the way that I I sort of look at it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. okay. Uh, and was actionable books because well, let's talk. Let's get into actionable books. I was going to kind of keep that powder dry, but we, we're kind of there, and it, it is interesting. So and that's why you're here. So let's just explain what actionable books is to the listener. So if TED, uh, TED Talks are ideas worth spreading, uh, actionable books are ideas worth implementing. Our focus nice. is around- hey, have, you, uh, have you worked on that pitch? <laughs> That was, you know, my wife came up with that. She's getting all the credit in this conversation, but my wife came up with that a few months ago and I thought, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And uh, so we've been, we've been playing with it a little bit. But, but, Um, you know, like that's so powerful. Can I just, I mean, I'll I'll just pull you up there because getting your pitch right like that (laughs) and comparing it to something that we already know and love is just a really powerful thing to do. And I'm not sure I've spoken about this before, Chris, but how many small business or how many business owners do we come across that trip over what they do when asked what they do, they kind of freak out. Yep. 
Yeah, well, and, and I mean, I think that's why I'm, I was really excited when Amy came up with that because um, I, I was that guy. I mean, I would spend 20 minutes trying to explain what we did and watch people's eyes glaze over at various speeds. Um, and so I <laughs> find that this now intrigues people enough that we can then go a little bit deeper if they want to. Uh, well, to, just to that end, mate, I think, can you put Amy on the phone? Because clearly she's in much more, <laughs> much smarter than you. <laughs> Well, that'll be the sequel. She's, and, she's out wandering the grounds. Oh, and bless her. She, she, got a, she got a wicker basket and wearing some kind of lace, you know, <laughs> Spanish dress. Because that's what they do over there. Yeah, that's what you just do. You kind of live the life, don't you? Absolutely right. Yeah, we've got the, I'm looking at the olive trees right now. It's oh, all, you're uh, killing me. Place. You're killing, uh, we, I digress, but it is important to get your pitch right. And you nailed it with that one. So well done. So, okay. If it's, if Ted, Ted's idea is worth spreading, uh, actionable books are ideas worth implementing. How does that show itself? So we, um, connect with. Top selling business authors, uh, yeah, authors of popular business books. Um, and we will disseminate ideas from those books and serve them up in bite sized quantities for people to easily put into practice in their busy lives. Um, so we do that through uh, tools and products for individuals, for teams, and for large scale uh, enterprise organizations. On a very high level, we do free uh, business book summaries. I saw you were poking around in there uh, earlier today, <laughs> uh, Tim, and I love, love <laughs> How did you say that? Because I left a comment on one of the um, blogs. Because you left a comment. And yeah, when you yeah. left it on the one uh, talk, talk like Ted, I thought, oh, I think we're going to have a great conversation. Yeah, yeah, Tim, yeah, so correct. It's well, <laughs> it's fantastic. So that's interesting. So at, at a high level, any of us can go mm-hmm. to actionable books and um, pretty much get a, read a very, very short summary of what the book's intention is. And then it looks like you then get a top three action points to implement immediately um, off the back mm-hmm. of that. That's That's your free offer, yeah? That's right. Yeah, that and the author interviews that I've been doing for uh, for a few years now. Yeah, they're cool. I know they know they've kind of dried up. Um, that's in, on your blog. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of a few months <laughs> since you've done one? Well noted, indeed. We're <laughs> we're actually Tim working on a podcast right now, and so we're stockpiling the first twenty four episodes. So we've moved from video interviews to audio, which is why there's that lull. But you're probably one of about six people on the planet to notice that. So thank you for that. Well, well you, I, there's a there's a couple of things there, and we're gonna I, this interview is gonna go all over the place and end up at a wonderful place. So let's just go there Perfect. because. Um, um, you were quite prolific in the way you were creating these video blogs to promote actionable mm-hmm. books. Um, listeners, for you can't see it, but what Chris did was he had a split screen, author one side, Chris the other, and they would talk. It was essentially a, a vodcast, I would call it. Um, and mm-hmm. um, I, I did notice that it had dried up, and I always look at that as, as a fellow content creator. I think one of the things that we have to do is be consistent, but- um, I pulled someone up on that a few episodes ago. I can't think who it was right now, but they said what they were doing is creating, um, uh, not episodes. They were creating seasons, you know? So it's like, right. you, you could have said that to me. You could have said, Oh, we were at the end of season <laughs> three, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's exactly what it was. We'll yeah, go back yeah. and edit that, right? Yeah, so yeah. We'll Bullshit. Put that in there. Make me sound brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So, okay. So let's. Uh, great. So you are gonna you're gonna be doing a podcast. Great. So I'll have another competitor very shortly. Um, <laughs> no, good on you. We need more. We need more podcasters out there. Underdone medium, Chris. Big Perfect. time. Yes, I agree. So, um, actionable books then, um, what, what fascinates me then is where's the business model? Yep. So the, it's a great question. So it started out as a hobby, as a passion project. It was really me, um, writing these summaries for a personal accountability vehicle. Um, and it was only, I mean, it wasn't meant to be a business originally, Tim. I was working in corporate marketing and I was enjoying myself <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was never, a, <laughs> I said marketing, not advertising. I do draw a distinction between the two. <laughs> you said uh, corporate though. <laughs> Ah, that's right. That's right. Um, it was an interesting space and I, you know, I, I don't think I would have been happy staying there, but I was, you know, 25 and, uh, and, and enjoyed the experience. Um, but people started to ask for more robust versions of the summaries. They said, this is great. But as you said, Tim, it's short. It's, you know, succinct. I want something that I can go a little bit deeper on. Do you have anything that I can use with my team? And I had that question come up more than a couple of times. Excuse me. And uh, so I said, yeah, I can create something. 
my background before uh, before actionable and before the corporate marketing was I was a, a sales manager and a recruiter and trainer um, for a, a direct sales company in, in Canada. And the one thing that I had done really well was, um, was retain my people. I was, I was crap at just about every other part of the business, but I was really good at keeping my people around. And, uh, well, and, how, and I did that, that through these. How'd you do that? Well, I, <laughs> thank you for the leading question, Tim. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, uh, spend an hour a week with my top people where we would talk about personal and professional development, not product, not sales. It was all about them. And how this job was helping them to achieve more in their own lives. And that format worked really well. And uh, so I, um, I mean, basically the idea there, right, is that if people feel like their job is advancing their life, then they're more likely to stick around at their job. It's not rocket science, but it's amazing how few managers actually sort of make that connection or choose to put that effort in. Role play so me. Just, roll, just, just humor me for one minute, Chris. I'm an unhappy okay, employee um, at Actionable Books and uh, – You've tapped me on the shoulder and said, I hope you realize, Tim, that this job is uh, adding to your life. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe not in that particular <laughs> order. I think, you know, I think this is, you know, we'll, we'll deviate here for a second and then I promise I'll get back to how we make money. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think this is one of the problems is that as managers, um, small business or otherwise, we tend to wait until that employee is unhappy and then start to justify or, you know, start throwing more money at them or whatever, if there's someone we want to keep. And it doesn't, I don't think it does a lot to bring people forward into that proactively engaged role. I think it just, you know, maybe brings them back to status quo, but more often than not, I mean, it's that whole squeaky wheel gets the grease, then, you know, you just, your whiners are getting your attention. Um, so, Tim, if you were ready to walk from actionable, I'm actually probably not going to do much to keep you around because I've already failed in my mind at that point. Gotcha. And I'm going to spend way more time with my top performers and, uh, and and not even top performers, just the people that I see the most potential in and uh, and and work to see what it is that they're looking to uh, accomplish or do either within actionable or otherwise, and then support that as best I can. Yeah, love it. Good, good, good response. Um, uh, how do you make money? We sell a tool called Actionable Workshops. Uh -huh. And team leaders use those workshops. They're hour long learning modules, just like I used um, in my previous life. Um, but they're inspired by the ideas from top business books and they're designed to engage a team in conversation. So a leader can access it and run it without bringing in a professional facilitator. Nothing wrong with professional facilitators, but sometimes you don't have the time or the money. And so this becomes a tool for engaging deeper, richer conversation uh, within a, a team, large and small. So uh, the team leader at a business in Boston mm -hmm. uh, finds you online, uh, pays to download uh, a one-hour actionable workshop around a particular book and runs it themselves. Is that it? That's correct. Okay, that then begs the question. I get that now. I get that's a – love it. Love it. You can run it from an olive field in Spain and have team leaders all over the world doing this. This is a wonderful business. Tell me what uh, – so many questions. So many <laughs> questions just pop up. What's that team leader Googling to find you? Because this is a good idea, but I'm – as a team leader of which I've been, mm. uh, I might I might Google – um uh, I don't know, team building exercises. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you just got an unbelievably sophisticated SEO strategy happening, a pay-per-click strategy? What are you doing? Yeah, it's actually an incredibly unsophisticated strategy that's working uh, fairly well, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, I just try to trip and fall into these things as often as I can, Tim. Um, yeah. It's the summaries, mate. It's the, the fact that employees or not employees, just people that are into business books, when they do a Google search for good to great or seven habits or quiet or any more recent book, we're, we're right up there. We're usually on the first page globally, um, for that summary and anybody How? that comes, How? it's, I mean, it's keyword focus within that summary. Um, we've, thankfully grown. So, you know, we're, we're a fairly trusted source as a site in general. Um, a lot of link backs, a lot of syndication where people are leveraging our summaries and reposting them, which we gladly encourage. Um, and time. I mean, it's been six years. Right. So just, just for listeners. Just, okay. Yeah. So six years, trusted site, great PR, great page ranking with Google. Um, mm -hmm. just so listeners, cause I haven't kind of had this geeky conversation, Chris, <laughs> on the show. Um, and it's kind of important, but it's, and it's hard not when you get under the hood like this, it's hard not to kind of geek people out, but yeah. 
Basically, if you, I'm going to summarize this and challenge me on it. If you, if you, if you spend time creating an incredibly helpful site, huh. rich in valuable content, not uh-huh. sales content, but uh-huh. val- I call it helpful marketing. Uh-huh. Um, over time, you become a, a, a point of reference for people. And y- y- when you do post something and you do complete your metadata and you do get your keywords in there, but certainly not keyword stacking or anything, but you right. do know what you want that page to rank for, then Google are going to look to it quicker and more deeply. That's right. That Absolutely. Kind of a good summary? I think that's a great summary, Tim. Well done, sir. Um, Thank you. I, I think the biggest thing for me, Tim, is that you know Google and, and all search algorithms are just becoming that much more sophisticated, that much more able mm. to see through the bullshit. And they need, am I allowed to say mm. bullshit? Um, you did. I did twice. And, uh, <laughs> they, it, you just, you, as you say, you can't stack rank these things. You can't really force it. It's, it's come about organically for us where we were providing these summaries because we wanted to provide the summary, not because we wanted to rank well for a certain term. Um, but over time that starts to add up. And now what we've really found is that we have a community of people that are learning what we do, whether it's relevant to them or not. And they become our ambassadors. And, you know, as old school as it sounds, after our geeky conversation, our business is referral driven. And that's where, where it comes from. Yeah, brilliant. Do you know, um, when Google updated their algorithm in October last year mm. in 2013, Chris, with the Hummingbird update, one mm. of the quotes from Matt Cutts at Google was, hey, listen, guys, we just want relevant, unique, helpful content produced regularly. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like that, that almost summarizes actionable books. Thank you. Helpful, I, unique, relevant content produced regularly. Boom. I think it summarizes a uh, small business, big marketing too. Stop it. Oh, hey, this is not a mutual admiration <laughs> society. Um, <laughs> brilliant. So when you get that up, it, it, it gets found. So when someone, let's say the next big book comes out next week, mm-hmm. you're onto it. You do a quick summary of it. You get that summary up there. It's getting Google juice from the get go as at the same time, the author and the publisher are getting it, getting it as well. That's right. And we, yeah, it's a great point. We really try to, when we can, um, get ahead of that curve or get ahead of that wave, um, and have the summary up at the same time as the book's going to market or, you know, get the authors to post our link to their, um, Amazon page or the publishers to post the interview that I'll do on, on their page. And, and those high, high credibility sources. I mean, if you get Random House or Penguin or something, uh, sending links back to you, they've had URLs since the birth of the internet. And so that, uh, that provides, uh, a lot of traffic for you for sure yeah it's pretty it's pretty powerful isn't it mm-hmm. you, you um tell me as a business model another thing that i'm interested in haven't spoken a lot about on this show you're you're a content creator you're also a curator of content i I'm, i think let me just think that out aloud yeah. you have a whole lot of people out in the big wide world in fact the number of staff you had uh, six staff 24 independent contractors 76 volunteers spanning six countries and nine time zones I'm not sure how current <laughs> that information is but I'm guessing it's something like that. Yeah. Um, you've got a whole lot of people curating content, yeah? That's right. That's right. Well, I was doing a summary a week personally for two years, um, and then my my hand started to cramp. Uh, uh, now, mm. I was just sort of reaching that uh, mental fatigue of that pace. And uh, this, uh, it's a longer story, but this group of volunteers started to emerge. And uh, yeah, we're actually closer now to, I guess, closer to 90 um, contributors that are producing summaries uh, for the site. Um, we're also, as you mentioned, I mean, we're a small team. There's there's six of us, or is there even, I guess there's five of us on core, quote unquote, staff but then we have this uh, consultant network that um, that's been growing out as well and that's been really exciting where we've got uh, effectively licensees of our program that um, all share this belief in the importance of improving uh, the work 21st century workplace and and the cultures and relationships that exist within it um, and these consultants all over the globe um, has been a really neat opportunity for expansion as well so yeah to your point we've got content people we've got delivery people and we've got staff and everyone plays in one big happy family the idea of content can- Curation, and let me define that for listeners, is taking existing content. So what Chris is doing with actionable books is he's taking a book that is existing content and then you are wrapping – sometimes you, it's a, you could wrap your own opinion around it. What you guys do is really summarize the book uh, in itself. So you're not bringing new ideas to it, but you are – you are curating additional content by wrapping uh, summaries around it. It's very um, 
it's a really powerful marketing strategy because I, I come across small business owners when I talk about this concept of help. I call it helpful marketing. They think they've got to create everything from scratch, mm-hmm. and that just puts the weight of the world on them. Whereas you don't have to do that. Yeah, I think you know to your point. I think you want to do something that provides value on top of the original offering. Otherwise, you're just you know sort of a scraping site like uh, you know like a, a BuzzFeed or something. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing against bug mm-hmm. fees. Terrible. Uh, the <laughs> But the, the, uh, yeah, I think to your point, I mean, the idea of adding your own level of value, our, our summary writers do, um, they, they're actually summarizing one idea from the book that most resonated with them and then two ways that they're thinking about applying it. So it's, you know, the, the step of value that they are providing is to say, you know, there's a whole book. Here's the one idea that most resonated with me. If you disagree, let's have a conversation around it. Um, but here's how I'm planning to apply that. So yeah, to your point, I think we just need to put our own spin on it and then it uh, becomes, yeah really not easy, but uh, easier than uh, creating everything from scratch for sure. Chris, you're, you said you're an open book before I hit record and and I am uh, try to be an open book. I, I'm looking through your book summaries mm. and was, and I'm gather, uh, it's fair to say actionable books is a, is a successful business. Is that fair to say? Before I say what I'm about to say, yeah, yeah I think there's always you know the next uh, next horizon, but no, uh, I'm I'm pleased, yeah, for sure. Of course, it's cash flow positive. It's 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 providing you with a lifestyle. It's providing a whole lot of people with work. Yes, you love what you do. Yeah, yes, yes, yes and yes, absolutely, cool. Uh, likewise, small business, big marketing, uh, the same. I mean, I love what I do. I cannot believe what it's done for my personal brand for my business it's added revenue streams that i never even considered blah 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 i personally am underwhelmed by the lack of commentary i get on the show notes of every Mm -hmm. episode Mm -hmm. i I know why because i've asked uh, and i can i can tell you why i too was a bit surprised at the lack of engagement on the page on the summaries on actionable books Mm -hmm. Uh, are you uh, I, I think I was absolutely. Um, I'm, you know, I find we'll put up an image on, uh, of, you know, I don't know, we, we never do cat images, but you put up an image on, on the site of some quote or whatever, and that gets, you know, 10 times more comments than the, uh, than the summaries do. Right. Because I think people just, you know, it's that bite size, uh, component. What we've really, well, that's, to, hang on. Are you ahead, referring, yeah. sorry, are you talking over each other? Are you referring to your Facebook? Was that social media activity you were talking about? Or right. was that a content? Of, yeah, okay. Well, I'm talking about content on, on our websites. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that um, if, you know, I was reading that TED book and that one that I provided a, co- a blog comment on mm-hmm. um, at the end of the summary. And I think I was the fourth person only to have done that. Now, I'm the same with my site, and for a couple of years, it really annoyed me, but I mm-hmm. went out to my Facebook, I went out to my community via Facebook and said, why, why when I post the fact that there's a new episode out that you don't go to the show notes and leave a comment, and very, very quickly came back in spades that um, they race off to iTunes or they race off to the website to download and listen to the website. By that mm-hmm. time, they've left the website, and um, there's no, they, they forget to comment, so- mm-hmm. Listeners, you are excused, <laughs> but that whole co- that whole uh, area of engagement and and see, I love seeing lots of comments Me on too. my blog posts, on my episode show notes, and yeah. So is, is, obviously, that's not something of a, as much of a concern to you. Well, you know, it was Tim, and I think you know, there's that double sided. One is the genuinely, I want to see people getting value from it and interacting with it. And on the other hand, you think, well, what if somebody, you know, like like Timbo comes to the site and he looks at it and goes, but nobody's commenting, so maybe it's not a real business. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's that sense mm. of sort of anxiety around optics. What I've found um, is that I'm over the last year and a half, I've made a really concentrated focus. And the whole team has around looking at the quality of those uh, relationships and engagements as much as the quantity or more so. Um, I'll tell you what I mean by that. We've we've really created little pockets where we have the actionable book club where groups of 12 people will connect on a call once a month with someone from our team to talk about um, talk about the books that they've read this month. Uh, we have those actionable consultant calls where we'll have 12 to 15 people. We'll do, we'll do these little mm-hmm. sort of micro events. We did an event in Toronto where we had about 40 people, so a little bit larger, but live event. Um, 
And it's, it's, I'm finding, we just uh, sort of scrapped half of our mail list. We said, if you haven't opened an email from us in the last 12 months, um, you know, we're going to remove you from the list unless you put your hand up and say, I've been in a coma, but I, I don't want to be removed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've really concentrated on, on reducing actually the, the reach and, and focus on the quality. I appreciate it. Those are the people that drive 95% of our business anyway. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. I think there's, you know, there's an ego piece of play. There's I I don't know why people don't comment. In I, I, more I think it is. I, yeah. I, 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 look, I think it is ego. It's me wanting, it's actually me wanting to converse with my listeners. That yep. said, uh, it, it's, it's the wrong scoreboard because I know my show is popular. Mm-hmm. I know people benefit. And, and to me, that's more, um, for me, that's more inspiring. And if I know that there are small business owners listening, implementing and winning as a result, then that's better than than any little comment I get on my blog post. But uh, in the early days, it was it was me thinking, shit, is there anyone out there? <laughs> yeah, but you're <laughs> out there too, right? So, I mean, you connect with people live and uh, and you're, you're, you're connecting yeah. people that way, which is great, yeah. Yeah, correct. Hey, um, so you went just back backtracking to sort of pre-actionable books or leading mm-hmm. up to it. You, you fifty, you, you had a few failures, and then you went and said, "Okay, I'm going to read a whole lot of business books." And you summarized <laughs> fifty two business books in fifty two weeks, applying one concept from each. That's right. Yeah, it was actually two years, but uh, the, that was the first year, and then uh, slowed down a little bit in year two. Um, yeah, wow. I mean, what, what did you, you like really to like that? Oh man, where do I start? Like, so you really did do that and you yeah. really did implement what, what change did you see from being so uh, military like in your personal development? <laughs> um, I actually saw, I saw more behavior change than, or sorry, I saw more mentality change than behavior change. Um, I, I, there's behavior change as a part of it, but I just found I, my business before had just gone totally down the tubes and, uh, and I was blaming everyone else in my life and in the world. There was no personal fault to be had. And through the, the reading and sort of expansive, uh, learning, I'd say, you know, I was picking up whatever cover grabbed me in the bookstore and, um, I still had bookstores back then. And, uh, I was, I would just grab whatever was interesting to me and, and read it. And so I was applying all these different lessons to, you know, personal growth and marketing and, uh, and leadership. And I didn't even have a team. I was just learning about leadership. Um, and so I think the biggest thing for me was just the, um, the breadth of exposure. Um, a couple mm-hmm. of the big ones, uh, I mean, getting things done by David Allen, which I'd never read before, um, found that helpful from a tactic standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. there was a book called, uh, the one minute millionaire, which is actually a fairly oh, yeah. fluffy book, but, uh, <laughs> there was an I- idea about, you know, just reaching out to people that you aspire to emulate and, uh, and ask them questions. Mm-hmm. And so that's really uh, helped on the interview path. And yeah, there's a whole range of, I, 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 I got to yeah. laugh. <laughs> I got to laugh about that Dave Allen book, get things done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a, I had a co-host on this show for the first 80 episodes, a mate called Luke. And, um, Luke loved getting under the bonnet of things, you know, getting in <laughs> understanding in micro detail all the various aspects of business and marketing that we talked about on the show. Whereas for me, I like to be more kind of macro sort of bird's eye view, Mm. a little bit more emotional in the kind of questioning. And we got, we had Dave Allen on the show and, um, and Luke almost had a meltdown. It was like having, for me, it'd be like having, be like having Bono on the show. Well, Luke had had Dave Allen. So listeners, you can go back. I'll put the link in the show notes to this episode, to the Dave Allen interview. But um, it was funny. I remember he was walking around his home talking to us on his iPad, and it was just one of those things where I couldn't bring myself to say, hey, Dave, can you, A, move into a room with carpet so there's no <laughs> bounce in the audio, and B, stop walking around. But yeah. um, <laughs> it was a, it's a fantastic book that even, even I got across the line with that process. Um, was there one book, Chris, that you read that changed everything for you? There's been several, um, but the the big one I nah, said the you first can't have one. Several. I don't- <laughs> you get a very uh, sore, you get a sore ass sitting on the uh, fence. God, all right. Um, then the one that I would say the first one that was truly game changing for me was a book called A Whole New Mind uh, by Daniel Pink. Uh, who's since gone on to write Drive and to Selling as Human or to Sell as Human, uh, but that book was instrumental for me. Why? It was. Um, 
what was it? It was a shift in mindset around the skills and attitudes that we need to succeed in the 21st century, um, which sounds really high level and academic, but it was, it wasn't, I mean, it was an emotional book that, that got me where, you know, I had the same sort of thought where in order to be successful in business, you needed to have an MBA and understand, you know, business strategy and, and financial, you know, planning and this sort of thing. And, and what, um, Dan's been, Dan's book said was, yeah, that's good stuff, but there's a whole other side to this, which we would now maybe call EQ, um, or, you know, creativity and that idea of tapping into quote unquote right brain, um, strengths in business and how beneficial that could be. And, and for me as a creative sort of person, um, I, I thought, yeah, this is the kind of business that I want to do. Yeah, right. Okay, I love those epiphanies. I hear people talk about, well, you didn't use the word epiphany, but it was a moment that, that did change everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I wish they could happen more often. Make it degrade. Well, you know, <laughs> I find that they happen most when I push myself out there to explore new things. I think we can increase them uh, by pushing ourselves into new situations, right? One of the reasons why we're in Spain. Yeah, I, I, totally, totally. And being aware, it just kind of, Having the epiphany radar out so that when something I, I had one, I sort of wasn't an epiphany today, but something happened where I thought, oh, two things happened within the space of about twenty four hours, and I'm thinking, eh, the universe is tapping me on the shoulder here. <laughs> I need to listen to that and and act on it, you know. Nice. Um, mate, I, I want to talk. I do want to talk about uh, back to marketing. So and your blogging because you were prolific. Um, you were doing these these video blogs, mm-hmm. um, and they they were good. Uh, two questions. One mechanical. Uh, what did you use to get the split screen thing happening? Um, so those ones, uh, I used a, a thirty dollar plugin called Call Recorder on Skype. Um, so it's literally. Oh, does that do it? That's what I've got. That's yeah. That's what I'm recording on. Well, that's what I use, and that does a split screen, does it? Yeah, you can do picture in picture. You can do split screen. You can record two separate video files. There's uh, there's a lot of flexibility with it. It's a great tool. That's hilarious. Uh, I did not know. I've been using Call Recorder for, <laughs> ooh, maybe five years. Um, I don't do a lot of video. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I, I don't do a lot of video, but um, I have been wanting to do some split screen stuff. So there you go. Great. Why are you moving from um, video blogging to podcasting? Uh, you know, part of it's exposure. Uh, part of it is, is maximizing reach. I'm just, I'm looking at trends and seeing that, you know, we had some fairly big names on the video series and, you know, unless the author they're promoted it heavily, heavily. We'd be less than a thousand views. Um, and you know, it's just, I look at other, um, I basically look at podcasting and see that it's a growing trend. People are starting to understand how it works with, you know, iTunes and whatnot. And so, uh, I thought, you know, let's, let's go where uh, the people are and, uh, not just keep oh, shouting in our quiet man. corner over here. That is music to my ears. I tell you what, and I say it from stage, I'll say it again now that we are in such early days of podcasting. We are in podcasting. It's 2 a.m. on day one on the <laughs> podcasting clock. You know, yeah. like podcasting has been around for about nine years now, but people are just starting to figure out, you know, in the masses uh, mm. how to access podcasts. They, they generally know what they are because most radio shows these days say at the end, oh, you know, you can find us as a podcast on iTunes. Mm. Um, the, Stitcher, one of the major yep. distribution apps for podcast is now being loaded onto the dashboard of new cars as of 2014 so man we are going to see it's just it's such early days we are going to see a real tipping point i'm sort of predicting in the next 12 to 24 months we might be a little bit slower back here uh, in australia but um i think as, as a worldwide phenomenon in marketing podcasting is is set to explode to that point you did have some big names on your video blogs. Mm-hmm. Getting under a thousand views is heartbreaking. We're yes. talking Seth Godin and Gary Vaynerchuk. Like, mate, how did you get them on to start with? <laughs> um, so Seth and Gary, it's funny you mentioned those two because they were my very first uh, interviews and they happened within an hour and a half of each other uh, in New York. <laughs> and uh, it was what had happened was a perfect storm where I'd been writing these summaries for a number of years. I'd written most of Seth's books into summaries. I had sent them every t- I made a habit of that. Every time I wrote a summary, I'd send it to the author saying, mm-hmm. hey, I know you're busy, but I did this. And if you like it, you know, awesome. <laughs> that was pretty much it. No ask. Yeah. Just here you go. 
And so Seth and I had had a series of one word email exchanges where in his sort of classic form, it's thanks, great, bravo, this sort of thing. Uh, and I reached out and I said, Hey, I know I finished Lynchpin is what had happened. And, um, I loved it and I wanted to talk to him about it and I was done. There was no more books. Um, and so I said, um, I'd love to talk to you about Lynchpin. And if you're up for it, I'll come down to New York. I will, um, you know, pay my own way and I'd love to talk to you about what's been happening in your head since. And he wrote back saying, sure, let's do it. And I fell off my chair. Um, but it was one of those things where he was doing this grassroots marketing tour for Lynchpin and he was, he was sort of shunning mainstream yeah. media. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, great. You, you got him at the right time. Uh, exactly I, I've right. shared a couple of times why he knocked me back. So I won't go into it again. You can go <laughs> and listen to past episodes, listeners. Uh, but, uh, what about Vaynerchuk, Gary Vaynerchuk, social media doyen? Yeah. So I was, I was going down to New York because up until the last four or five, they were all live face to face interviews. They weren't even split screen. They were on a couch together. Yep. Um, and yep. I, um, and so I reached out to Gary saying, Hey, I'm coming down to New York, um, to interview Seth Godin because it's always good to name drop when you're doing these things. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're up for it, I'd love to swing by your office. And Gary, you know, if he has time, will pretty much say yes to anything. And, uh, I, yep. I learned and I think it's maybe changed as he's become more popular because this is, five years mm -hmm. ago now um but uh but yeah so he said sure and so i i basically flew into uh newark and went to midtown interviewed gary jumped in the rental car and blasted up to yonkers which is north of uh, manhattan and uh and went went to seth's office and then night and day man just that night brilliant. and day <laughs> the offices and the the interview and yeah it was it was pretty funny experience yep. uh night and day as in one was very vastly different to the other uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, just as one small anecdote, I mean, Seth's office is about 2,600 square feet and it was him and uh, Shita who was um, working, collaborating with them on some projects then. And then Gary's office is about half that size with 40 people in it. We had like 10 minutes. There was an MTV crew outside while we were shooting the video in the office. And it was it was just, you know, sort of pandemonium compared compared to this almost yeah. zen-like experience in Seth's office as he made us tea. Oh, I love it. Love it. Oh, that's a great, that's a great insight. Uh, to, and well done for getting those interviews. I am surprised at just how many people do say yes to being interviewed. Yeah. Disappointed that Seth did, but um, I'm gonna, I'll have another crack at some point in time. So, um, Absolutely. Hey, that's brilliant, Chris. Uh, I, I really, a great story. Um, there's a lot we can learn from what you're doing in terms of uh, the, the creation of content. You're, you're creating it to sell. Uh, we, you know, I encourage my listeners who are, you know, vets and plumbers and accountants to create it to uh, help others in the hope that you'll build a tribe and mm -hmm. get people, em people emotionally connected to what you do um what what's next what's your kind of next big step for actionable books i'm coming to melbourne i'm uh heading ah! down <laughs> so yeah it's uh this actionable consultant program our, our licensing program where we work with business coaches uh, and consultants that want to leverage our programs into their business and tap into that community of like-minded peers it's by far the fastest growing part of our business right now um and uh one of the big sort of surges of interest came from uh, australia and so uh yeah about six months ago i guess we started connecting with uh, business coaches and consultants in all across Australia and uh, found that um, there was this interest and so started putting together a class and we're doing our first ever Australian uh, ACP training class in uh, at the end of August. Love it, mate. Oh, well, well, tap me on the shoulder. I'll put a link in the show notes to that for, uh, for this episode and um, good luck with that. Uh, great to see such good quality content uh, finding its way down under and, you know, not in New York or some fancy, fancy city. You know? I'm, I'm Canadian. Hey, mate, I reckon we've, got, it, we've got the connection to the Australian Well, we have so much in on. common. We are exactly. brothers. Exactly. We exactly. are brothers. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, listen, I think I can hear uh, Amy uh, yelling in the background that the olives have ripened. The calamatas are ready <laughs> to be picked. And uh, she's also just sent me a text saying she is infinitely smarter than you. And how dare you talk for so long uh, on Australia's number one marketing podcast without telling her. <laughs> I'll, I'll go apologize <laughs> now, Tim. Thank you. Chris Taylor, Actionable Books. Thanks for being a part of the show, mate. My pleasure, man. Thank you. Righto, team. I hope you loved that interview as much as I loved bringing it to you. Before I share my top three learnings from it, I want to let you in on a little secret that smart business owners everywhere are onto. 
Have you got marketing materials lying around that need a little loving, a little tweaking? Maybe you've got some stationery that needs updating or a logo that needs pimping. Or you want to update your social media headers and avatars. Now, that is not a problem at all, thanks to the very good team at Swiftly. For just $19 and less than one hour, Swiftly make small design fixes real fast. That's how they roll. You simply upload the artwork that needs fixing, tell them what needs doing, and bang, one hour and 19 US dollars later, it's done. Check them out at swiftly.com. That's S-W-I-F-T-L-Y. Okay, so my top three learnings from that chat with Chris at Actionable Books. Number one, read more. I don't know about you, but I make a habit of always having one business book on the go. I can never read them uh, in bed at night, so you will not find a business book on my bedside table anymore because I get too stimulated, too excited and I can never sleep after reading a business book. So often what I'll do is go to a cafe uh, at the start of the day, smash through a little soy latte, and uh, and read a little bit of a business book just to get my mind in shape. In fact, I'm reading a book at the moment which I'm considering a business as a business book. It is absolutely not. It's the biography of Michelangelo called The Agony and the Ecstasy. And what I love about it, is his passion for sculpture, his single-mindedness for wanting to pursue the next block of stone, and just incredible. One of the other things I love about it too is he lived for a number of years with the Medici family, and Lorenzo Medici was the richest man, I think, in the world, certainly in Europe uh, at the time, in in the 15th century. And Lorenzo would bring together all the opinion leaders uh, and people that he wanted to surround himself for great conversation. Every dinner time, it was an open table, and 60 people were invited. They could just go in, sit with Lorenzo, and chew the fat, and he would get around and speak to each one of them. And um, I thought, that's fantastic, because again, as business owners, as business leaders, maybe we don't do that enough, and we're too busy on the business, uh, too busy in the business to be working on the business. But yeah, so Agony, The Agony and the Ecstasy is my business book of choice at the moment, biography of Michael Angelo. But yeah, point being, read more. You want a book to read? Uh, I've mentioned some recently, $100 Startups Good, Blink's Good. Um, You've got to read Purple Cow by Seth Godin. Um, there's just three to get you going, but there's so many different great business books out there. Um, I must do a blog post on one very soon. Number two, learning from Chris, trip and fall and then get back up. You know, we do all fail and you've got two choices when you fail, wallow in your misery or get back on your horse and the good ones amongst us, we get back on on our horse and I know many of you do too. Forum member, uh, Vineyard Paul, right now, just reading a forum post. He's trying to get a podcast up. He's been kicked in the head a couple of times by guests, potential guests who have said no to him, kind of losing a bit of faith in the whole thing, but he's back on his horse. He's motivated to do it again. A lot of our, a lot of the forum members were kind of encouraging him, giving him tips and ways of moving forward with it. And I was just reading a post from him this morning where he is he is no longer discouraged and he's going to get back on his horse and keep moving forward. The good ones do, hey? Setbacks are great, like, like I had at the REIV conference earlier this week. That was a setback. I could have had a meltdown. Like, you know, I was, there was a point where I'm going, wow, this is going to be a disaster for the REIV, for me, my personal brand, because they're going to go, oh, Timbo just stuffed his keynote. It wasn't my fault, but it was my problem. Instead, I chose to see a positive, find a quick solution, and it worked. I hope you can find the strength to do that too if you're listening in a bit of a downtime in your business. Number three, look for people smarter than you. Chris's wife, he said she's a lot smarter than him. As business owners, finding good people is hard, keeping good people is harder, but you've got to find people smarter than you. If you build a brand, if you build a helpful business, if you build uh, a business that people love to work at because it's got cool marketing or you're doing helpful marketing or you've just built this really nice equity in your brand that people want to be a part of, and you don't have to be a big business to do this, by the way, um, then you are going to succeed. And I've always taken the attitude that you need people smarter than you. If you're the smartest in your business, then uh, maybe you should uh, drop the ego and go and find a highly intelligent person to challenge you 
on a more regular basis. So they're my top three learnings from my chat with Chris. If you've got something that you learned, then head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and look for episode 199. And we also talk about every episode inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. So feel free to jump in there over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and click on the forum button. Righto, team, that almost brings us to the end of this week's episode from a car in Queenstown, New Zealand. A uh, couple of things. Yeah, 200th episode coming up next week. No big deal, but I do have a little surprise guest uh, life got in the way in terms of doing anything, as you know, uh, for a live event. We'll do one uh, in the coming months or yeah, at some point in time when life isn't so busy and I aren't traveling as much. But um, we do, I do have a nice little surprise guest. I know you're all going to enjoy hearing from him or her next week. Uh, I've got an episode of Funny Business coming up with our old mate Griffo. I'll be speaking to a fellow uh, who's making good coin from reviewing frozen foods. Can you believe it? That's right. And plenty more guests. Even got some really exciting sponsor news to come up in the coming weeks as well. Hey, listen, join the forum if you want to continue the marketing discussion over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Remember, Net Registry are there to get your online marketing sorted. Just tell them Timbo sent you over at netregistry.com.au. And if you have any small design fixes needed to be done real quick, visit the guys at swiftly.com. Until next week, may your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.